Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, This month's program is What Does This Season's Corn Silage Look Like? And our presenter is Neil Winninger. He is the feed and forage consultant with Dairyland Labs. And he's going to be discussing what the lab analysis from this year's corn silage samples are telling him about the quality of the crop and what producers can anticipate about how it will convert into milk in the tank. Neil grew up on a dairy farm in central Wisconsin, earned his BS in broad area ag at UW River Falls. He's been dairy nutrition consulting for 16 and a half years and has been with Dairyland Labs for seven years as a feed and forage consultant. Neil, always delight to have you Tell us about the corn silage we just harvested. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, We certainly appreciate the opportunity to primarily touch on corn silage and looking at the 2022 crop, which we've seen through the lab thus far, and kind of compare it to what the the historical data, three-year data uh, through the lab. And then I'll uh, touch briefly on alfalfa haylage, what we've seen for the 2022 crop and compared to historical data. And then lastly, uh, some of the alfalfa grass mix data that we can go through. So the first slide here I'd like to share is, uh, this this slide came from Dr. Bill Weiss at Ohio State, um, talking about the partitioning of energy coming from corn silage. Kind of the main reason I like to share this one is it, it really brings the point, you know, what, what are the big values in corn silage, right? You know, 42% of the energy coming from starch contents and 31% of the energy coming from NDF. So, you know, that's kind of the big take home point of this slide is why corn silage has been a uh, growing component and such a large component of a lot of dairy diets and other diets for that matter. But, you know, the take home there is is NDF and starch are the big components and and, uh, what they bring to the diet. What we're seeing here through the lab for the 2022 crop here and versus the historical data uh, 2019 through 22, I guess, first off, looking at the moisture contents, you know, not much of a change from from last year, from previous data to to new crop. Protein contents are pretty similar, just the uptick of a, a tenth of a point there. NDFOM. So total fiber contents just down just a touch from 37.2 down to 36.9. NDF digestibility, um, just a slight downturn in NDF digestibility, but, you know, really in the big picture, not a huge change from previous historical data. UNDF 240, you know, UNDF 240 is that undigestible NDF, seems like more and more nutritionists. And he's using that as a marker for the total diet or, you know, marker for ranking corn silage or forages in general. Um, Just a slight uptick in UNDF 240, which would be inverse to the NDFDs, really. Um, So that kind of is in line with what the NDFD 30s did there. Uh, A slight uptick in starch content, you know, like like I previously mentioned there, obviously starch and NDF are the two big nutrients that we kind of focus in on the most with, because that's what's really uh, what corn silage is bringing to the diets uh, for the most part. Fat, of course, fat is not a huge component in corn silage, but it could be obviously a contributor with the fat content you can get in the kernels, but 2.2, we had no change from historical data to, to new crop. And then the ash contents went down slightly from historical data at 4.3 down to 3.9 here on new crop. So not a huge change, but it went in the right direction. Um, I think last year, we some of this historical data, we tended to see maybe a little more soil contamination that elevated some of those previous year's data as a whole. And then lastly here, uh, milk per ton, uh, the milk per ton energy equation. I know a lot of people like to look at that as an index, bringing all the energy into one one number to compare compare varieties. It doesn't have a lot of utility in in balancing diets, of course, but it certainly brings everything into one number. So looking at the the previous three years data, the milk per ton 
was 34.56 compared to 2022 data, the median of 3,500 pounds of milk per ton of dry matter silage. Um, nextly, breaking it down into Iowa specific samples here. So we're comparing the Iowa 2022 corn silage um, samples versus all of our 2022 data. And you kind of go down through the same nutrients here. Moisture was exactly the same. Um, one thing the Iowa samples did have a, a slight uptick of uh, 0.3, 8.3 versus 8. So a little higher protein, but kind of focusing in on the NDF and starch here, slightly lower NDFs on the Iowa samples, but really not a huge difference. A uh, slight uptick in NDFD um, versus our total data. Um, so that's good for the Iowa samples there. And the UNDF was very similar there again. Slight uptick in starch from 38 you know, 34.8 on the Iowa samples versus our, our total database of new crop samples at 34.4. Uh, there again, the, the fat contents are same and the ash is very similar. Lastly, you know, comparing that milk per ton index, obviously very similar, similar 3503 versus 3500. So virtually one in the same. I think the uh, the uptick in NDFD kind of washed out some of the other differences um, to make that, obviously that made the milk per ton slightly higher, but not, not a huge number higher there. Uh, next year I compared, uh, I wanted to compare Iowa 2022 samples versus a year ago when we did this and presented the 2021 data to give you more uh, relevance to the Iowa Iowa samples directly. Moisture contents were very similar versus samples we saw from last year in Iowa. Uh, here again, back to the protein, slight uptick on the protein in this year's samples. NDF is actually down about a point, 1.7 versus last year's samples. I think last year's samples out of Iowa were slightly higher in NDF versus our total database but the NDFDs were higher last year in, in Iowa samples. So that's one difference versus our, our total database of samples are actually, uh, um, so that was part of the difference there. And then a slight uptick in the UNDF 240 again, um, but then here um, about a point uptick in the starch contents. Uh, and then you get down to the bottom line, you know, your milk per tons are actually up um, slightly with the 2022 crop samples. Um, I think that uptick in starch kind of offset the NDFD going down. So really dependent on what your diet needs, of course, are whether it's, you know, most diets need some combination of starch and NDF and NDF digestibility. Certainly higher starch silage might fit in certain diets better than our others, of course. So here's the same 2022 corn silage data versus our historical samples. But then I broke out here just uh, BMR specific or brown midrib specific samples and looking at the 2022 samples versus the historical BMRs and then comparing versus um, the total database of corn silages. You know, I guess in general, the BMRs, they tend to be a little higher in moisture um, when they're harvested. I think part of that is uh, just the fact that there's probably more progressive uh, farms growing BMRs versus the total database of corn silage. Uh, maybe some of that's put up for beef cattle or uh, heifer lots and things like that. So it, it, I mean, it's not a huge difference, but it is a difference. The, the moisture contents being a little bit higher on the BMRs. Protein, very similar across the board. NDF contents is another uh, difference here with the NDFs tend to be a little higher with your BMRs. Um, but of course, here on the NDFDs, your NDF digestibilities are significantly higher than the average corn silages, about seven, seven points higher than our total database of corn silages. And then of course, inverse of that, the UNDFs or undigestible NDF is down about two points versus the total database on, on UNDFs, which is pretty typical uh, on the average uh, BMR sample. And then inverse to, you know, being the NDFs are higher, the starch is typically a little bit lower with BMRs. Um, so we're about a point and a half lower on your uh, your starch contents on the BMR corn silages versus uh, our total uh, database for corn silages. Uh, fat contents, very similar. Uh, there again, ash contents are down from a year ago or down from the historical samples, which is good, uh, but very similar to the total database of samples. And then lastly, uh, again, looking at the milk per ton index, um, obviously we want to see uh, as high a milk per ton index as possible. So um, those BMRs are showing uh, about 200, 200 pounds more milk per ton uh, on the average versus the, the total um, corn silage database and a little bit higher than the historical samples there. 
protein isn't a huge component in corn silage, but we do see a range of, you know, typically around that six to nine and a half covers most of your, uh, your protein values in, in your typical corn silages with the brunt of the corn silage being somewhere in that seven to eight range, you know, back on focusing on one of the bigger components, starch, you know, obviously uh, most of the starch contents in corn silage range from 20 to 45 um, with your your mean or your averages being in the mid 30s. And then of course, NDF there again, you're in that similar range, um, you know, 25 to 45, 50 NDF with, with most of the samples falling somewhere between, oh, in that mid 30s range. So pretty similar, really starch, starch on average is in the mid 30s and NDF is in the mid 30s um, for the most part. Uh, and then lastly, UNDF, the di distributions of UNDF 240 that we typically see on corn silage of six to around 13, 14, uh, with, with most of them falling somewhere in that uh, eight, nine, 10 range. So IVSD7 stands for in vitro starch digestibility at seven hours of digestion. And uh, I like this slide um, just demonstrating really the importance of letting the crop ferment to get the most out of your starch and, and starch availability. So all these green little dots are individual corn silage samples and the, the brown line is our average uh, seven hour starch value over time. This is going back last fall when we, you know, when we began seeing all these new crop, fresh, unfermented corn silages that are down here in the 40s and 50s for seven hour starch. And then once you see a majority of this crop or a bigger majority of the crop fermented, you obviously see this nice slope up and then it kind of levels off as the year goes on uh, for that seven hour starch digestibility value. You know, obviously the whole year we kind of see a small sprinkling of samples that are low digestibility of starch, but uh, obviously we want to we want to focus in on uh, making sure we're we're feeding well fermented corn silage, so we're getting the most out of our starch as we can. We don't want that in our manure, of course. And focusing in on that IVSD seven or in vitro starch digestibility at seven hours. Um, last year, uh, we broke down the samples that came in between September and November twenty one. Um, versus this year's samples, September through November 22. Um, the median IVSD7 value is very similar as last year. And last year, if you remember, um, this was down slightly from the 2020 data, but we have a huge range, minimum of 55, 56, all the way up to 80. You know, and there again, those, those samples that are in that 75, 80 and over are most likely still samples that were fermented for over a year, whereas these ones that are down in the 50 to 60 range are unfermented, early fermenting samples that are uh, not going to get the bang out of that starch that you would like. We updated our CSPS data, uh, corn silage processing scores. And so this is going back all the way to 2012 through current. And again, this black line is the trend line. So basically the average CSPS score over time. So the CSPS score is basically a measurement of the percent of starch passing the 4.75 millimeter screen in that CSPS methodology. Um, obviously, like I say, seeing this trend line going up, the industry's done a, a very nice job of improving awareness of making sure that kernels are getting processed well, but of course, too, the equipment has gotten better and better over time with better processors. Um, so really that that median and average value is almost touching 70 is kind of the goal to be optimum. And that green dash line is where that 70 comes across. And we're almost hitting that with the average sample now. Um, certainly there are still samples down here where we don't like to see them in the in the 40s and 50s. Um, so there's still some potential improvement to be gained there. Obviously particle size is a big deal when it comes to starch uh, availability. This is our distribution that we see through the lab for corn silage processing scores uh, for the 2021 and 22 crop years. So again, this green area is the optimally processed corn silage, so the samples that are over 70 um, CSPS score or kernel processing score. Uh, this blue area would be the samples that are considered adequate, meaning they're 50 to 70 percent. They're CSPS score, um, but then here are the samples that are below 50 that are considered inadequate processing. Um, so still there's 
obviously some samples that are still inadequately processed. And really, you know, like I was mentioning, the industry is this, this whole distribution has been moving in the right direction, which is good. Talking about dairy fecal starch, you know, obviously that's kind of a measurement of how much starch or corn is coming through in the manure. And as time goes on, uh, we definitely see more and more samples coming through the lab for um, fecal analyses, both starch and, and other components. Um, but this, uh, this kind of is depicting the dairy fecal starch over time, going back again to 2012 through current. The green line is, is the trend line. So we see a nice downtrend here from 2018. It looked like we had a little rougher year right in that that area for a um, little higher fecal starches on average, um, but it's kind of trended down, which is a good trend to see. Obviously, we don't want starch in the manure, but we are still seeing there are some concerning samples that do come through the lab where um, we have starch, significant starch in the manure. Just kind of the normal distribution of fecal starch samples that we see through the lab, uh, and this includes kind of the UW interpretation guidelines that came out years ago. So the green area is samples that are uh, less than 3% fecal starch. Uh, the gray area is three to five and over five, kind of the interpretation was to investigate individual feeds to figure out where that fecal starch was coming from. So obviously there's still, you know, like I say, there's still a fair amount of samples that come over 5% fecal starch, but in general, obviously, a bigger majority of the samples are coming in less than three. And, and really the, as time goes on, the, the goal, the goal would be as close to zero as you possibly could get. Right. But, uh, um, you know, that's kind of headed in the right direction, but uh, obviously there's still samples that, uh, or uh, herds that might be having challenges with, with starch digestibility. Um, well, I kind of hammered on, on, uh, starch and, and fiber, uh, uh, long enough there uh, with corn silage, but one of the common questions we get is, uh, what are we seeing on uh, on mycotoxins in the new crop? And I uh, I just kind of put together a slide on vomitoxin specifically because that seems like the most common one that gets talked about quite a bit on on corn silage and and corn grains and such. Uh, and here I broke broke down what we're seeing so far with vomitoxin levels in the new crop samples for corn silage, uh, broke it down to samples that are non-detectable or less than 0.1 ppm, 0.1 to 0.5, 0.5 to 1, 1 to 2.5, 2.5 to 6, and then over 6. And just kind of showing the distribution, what percent the samples are following into those, those ranges. Um, and when I compared this to previous years, you know, we still are seeing a fair percentage of samples here in some concerning ranges of vomitoxin, uh, but it is down from say last year's crop. Last year's crop, we were having over 5% of the samples over six PPM. So just wanted to point out, you know, obviously we're still, we have some samples that are non-detect and some samples that are probably considered safe, but just wanted to point out that, you know, might be a consideration to keep, keep in mind that there are some samples that are, that are uh, concerning with vomitoxin. Certainly not uh, uh, the worst year for vomitoxin. And we'll move along here to uh, alfalfa haylage on what we're seeing for 2022 crop year uh, versus the historical data. For moisture contents, obviously they're very similar to corn silage, not much movement from uh, old crops to, to this year's new crop in that 56, 57% moisture range. Protein, we see a slight uptick. Um, obviously, protein is a bigger player here with alfalfa haylage versus uh, uh, previously talking about corn silage. Um, so that's a nice trend. I mean, it's not much of a trend, but it's still a trend upwards with crude protein. Uh, NDFOM, our fiber contents, um, down just a, a small tick there. NDFD, we're seeing a slight uptick on the new crop samples going from 48.5 up to 49.1. A small good trend there. Uh, UNDF 240, of course, inverse to NDF digestibility. We see a small down, downward trend, uh, 16.7 down to 16.5. So that's, like I said, that's a small, small change, but a, a change in the right direction. Ash contents, certainly that's with... Uh, Crops like hay crops, obviously ash is a player and we didn't see much change here. Obviously 11.1 to 11.1, so no change. Um, but I think in general, the industry's doing a better and better job being aware of potential ash issues in our hay crop. 
forages. Moving along here, a lot of people obviously like to look at RFE and or RFQ on your, your hay crop forages. We just saw a slight uptick in the uh, median RFV values versus the historical data going from 151 to 152. And kind of same goes here for the RFQ. Very similar, but headed in a positive direction, 160 up to 162. Now breaking it down more regionally uh, with your Iowa 2022 samples here compared to our total database, slightly lower moisture contents, an upward tick uh, with the Iowa samples being 21.7 on your crude proteins. NDF, just a slight down tick, just a 0.1 difference there from a 36.3 to a 36.2. Kind of uh, very similar across the board. Last year, I think we saw more differences here too with uh, the Iowa samples versus our total database. But um, this year in general, obviously pretty similar. RFVs, you know, 150 versus 152. RFQs, 163 versus 162. You know, we're kind of in a pretty similar similar range there. Uh, but if anything, you know, obviously seeing a positive there with the protein and positive here with the RFQ being that the, you know, your NDFDs and the NDF, they're kind of in combination. Uh, again, broke down the Iowa 2022 samples and compared to last year's uh, 21 samples when we, when we looked at this. So here again, we're seeing a little less moisture content, which is probably good seeing less, maybe those high-end uh, moisture samples that can cause fermentation problems. Uh, seeing that slight uptick in the protein again, which is good. NDFs, very similar. NDFD, we see a, about a half point uptick, which is good. And UNDF, just a slight, slight down tick there. Uh, ash, very similar. And then again, getting to our indexes, the RFE and RFQ uh, in a very similar realm again. Uh, here's our distributions on some of your major nutrients in the alfalfa haylage. You know, looking at the 2022 crop versus the three-year data. Yeah, obviously the distributions are very similar, being we cover such a huge geography with samples coming in from all over the country. Obviously protein, like I mentioned, is a bigger player with our alfalfa haylages. You know, we typically see somewhere around 16 up to 26 covers most of the samples. And then that average or medians falling in that 20 to 22 range for the majority of the samples. Uh, the NDF contents, you know, most of the samples are going to be covered somewhere in that 27 to 46 NDF with, you know, the median and averages, the majority of the samples falling in that 32 to, to upper 30s range for NDF contents. NDF D30s, you know, most of the samples are going to be somewhere between mid 30s to to 60 percent ndfd you know whereas those you know the high-end ndfds most of those samples we would see typically on your early and late crops so your first first cuttings and and fourth or fifth cuttings we tend to see the higher ndfds um, but on your average and median here most of them are falling in that 45 to 50 uh, range on the ndfd 30s and then uh, undf 240s kind of the uh, distribution most of the samples fall 10 to about 24 percent obviously you get into that 24 percent UNDF that's some pretty woody stuff and uh, indigestible alfalfa uh, whereas on this low end is some pretty pretty rocket fuel type alfalfa like I say majority of the samples are falling in that 15 16 17 UNDF range um, so lastly, we'll move on here to uh, some of the alfalfa mix, grass mix, haylage data uh, and comparing the, the 2022 crop versus 19 through 22. Again, moisture contents really don't change a whole lot. Protein sees a slight downtick. Your NDF contents actually see a slight uptick. Um, but I think, uh, like I mentioned last year, it does seem like in some of our our database, we are tending to see some more mixes coming in as time goes on. And my point being with that is that um, I think some of these mixes, we're seeing more grass coming into some of these mixes, a larger percentage of grass, which is, I think, part of this reason is you see this uptick in NDF. It's not a huge uptick, but it is an uptick in NDF. But we also see an uptick in the NDFDs. You know, your RFE slightly went down versus the historical, but the RFQ held in there since the NDFD went up. Uh, so all in all, really not uh, much for changes there. Uh, then breaking out the Iowa samples. Keep in mind here when I was looking at breaking out the Iowa samples for alfalfa grass mixes, it was pretty limited data. I think it was only 121 samples that I found came out of Iowa that were classified as alfalfa grass mix. So this is very limited data. Um, so we do see some larger differences here 
in the Iowa samples versus all samples through all of our labs. I would take it with a little bit of a grain of salt that this is pretty limited data. And I do think that even these samples from Iowa are probably even more slanted more heavily to heavier grass because number one, we see significantly lower protein, 17.5 versus 19.4. And then here again, we see higher NDFs of 43 versus 40. Here we see a little bit of offset of that higher NDF with a higher NDF digestibility. So taking that into the calculations again of our indexes, obviously that was significantly lower RFV going from 137 to 126. Some of that NDFD did keep us from falling off on those RFQs. I think the big take home point, this is fairly limited data. And I do think this is probably heavier, heavier towards the grass end on these particular samples. Um, but like I say, it is pretty, pretty limited number of samples on this uh, forage category for us. Uh, here I'll break out again the uh, the Iowa 2022 alfalfa grass mixes versus last year's data out of Iowa that we looked at. I think last year we had a few more samples in this category for whatever reason, but I think, like I say here again, we see this downturn in the protein upturn in the NDF, but the upturn in the NDFD where that's why I think that the sample volume is, is pretty limited here and more heavily biased or weighted towards grasses in, uh, for whatever reason, out of those 120 samples that we saw this year uh, so far. If you can go back to that slide where we showed the components in alfalfa, this... it looks to me like we're getting better quality alfalfa. We're getting a higher crude protein, but our outliers are getting fewer. We have fewer at the 17% and 15%, but we're certainly, am I interpreting that right? Oh, I, I would say yes. We definitely have a tighter, yeah, I didn't do the distributions for like the alfalfa mix, but obviously with the mix, with the grasses in there, we're going to see a wider wider distribution whereas straight alfalfa haylages we do we do tend to see but i think like you say to your point uh i think the industry is doing a better job uh getting alfalfa put up you know so we're seeing we're seeing more of these high quality more consistent quality on alfalfa well and then this year too we we saw a lot of samples get put up this fall after even after uh corn silage you know, with the fall, we had a really nice fall and there were certain geographies where we were getting some pretty, pretty nice alfalfa samples coming in this fall. So that was, that was good. Especially in our, our alfalfa uh, forages, what is the range of ash? I mean, are there some really low and some that really knocked the bucket up? Right. I think, yeah, I don't know the, the for sure range, but I'm sure the range is going to be covered for the most part, somewhere between, oh, I would say majority of the samples are going to be eight to eight to 14 would cover most samples, but those outliers that get over 14 are the ones that are, uh, ones that are getting a little challenging, right? Because yeah. when they're you're getting over be, 14, yeah. Yeah, they're going to be heifer hay or steer uh, hay or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got a lot of soil contamination um, when you're getting to that level, I think for the most part. You know, certainly there's some alfalfas that get pretty high in potassium as well that would, you know, play into that total ash yep. content. But uh, typically when you're getting that high, you're, you're getting fairly significant soil contamination. When we were talking about some of the variability and the low uh, numbers for our grasses, is that because Iowa tends to have some lower quality grasses of the looking at some bromes or compared to the eastern par states. Yeah, I like I say, I, I would take that with a grain of salt because it is very limited sample volumes. And yeah, I, it's probably some of that. I mean, maybe a higher percentage of those samples out of that 120 samples that I found very well could have been more from, say, beef situations versus dairy quality situations would be, I would bet that that would explain a lot of that. But like I said, just 120 samples is very limited. So to get a normal distribution, I just don't feel like that's a normal distribution just because it's so different from, you know, even comparing the Iowa samples versus last year's, you know, this is quite a difference. So I really don't, I just think it's just not enough samples to give us a good you know, a good take on what, what truly is out there for Iowa quality. Because, I mean, you look at the quality 
of the straight alfalfa samples out of Iowa, are, you know, if anything, they're a touch, touch better than our total database. So yep. I just think that it's probably of those 120, I think is, is uh, it's probably weighted towards higher grass and maybe more mature grass that's going to beef versus dairy would be my, my guess. I was just curious on the breakdown between BMR and traditional silage. What do you think the, the ratio is or what percent of the market is around midroom? I'm sure, well, part of that, part of that question, um, I don't know what the actual percentage of the market is, the percentage of samples that we get through the lab that are actually labeled BMR. So that's the next thing. I mean, I'm only quantifying these ones that are in this BMR area on my summary or our summary, I should say, are samples that were labeled as BMR and they're known BMR. So, but I, we also know there's got to be some unidentified BMRs that are coming in that we just don't know for sure that they're BMRs, but they, they okay. fall, they fall in as a, you know, a conventional just because, sure. just because we don't know for a hundred percent fact. Yeah. So there's, that's part of it. So I okay. guess long, long story short, if we calculated the percent of BMR versus non BMR that we get through the lab, it, it probably wouldn't really truly represent, sure. you know, the percentage out in the field just because of lack sure. of identification on the samples. One more question. Then when we were talking about fecal starch, five and above, we say, okay, we got to look to see what's going on there. Do we think that we're moving, we're going to move that line to three and above? Is that probably more beneficial as a consultant? If it's above three, you best be looking for something. I would agree with that. Like I say, these interpretations, when they came out of um, like I say, they came out of University of Wisconsin and they are, I mean, I'm not knocking on the interpretations, but they are older interpretations. So they're from back, they're from back in the day when higher fecal starches were maybe more normal, you know, back before a time when we did a better job processing corn silage, probably back before a time when we processed our dry corn or processed our high moisture corn well, you know, so there's so many factors that probably went into how this interpretation got put together years ago. But yes, long story short, I would agree with you. This this metric, if I was still doing nutrition work, yeah, if it's over three, I would want to investigate because obviously that much starch in the manure is still a lot of dollars and both dollars in corn just going through in the manure, but also missing out on dollars with feed efficiency, with that starch just taking up room in the diet. So yeah, to me, I think a reasonable goal would be to get in that two range, really. But certainly, I think I would agree with you that over three would be a good point to be investigating further for sure. Neil, thank you very much. Always interesting to see the data from one year to the next. And we appreciate how you interpret it and help us understand what we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.